Thank you, Pastor Ron. Uh, like Pastor Ron said, I am Jeremy Sesa, the youth leader here at CCF San Francisco. Um, even though Pastor Ron called me a pastor, I don't feel like I've uh, gotten there just yet. Um, yes, I am the youth leader here at CCF San Francisco. I am glad to be up here. I think last time I was up here was only just about a month ago. Um, it's really not that crazy. Nothing happens in that one month that we have. Um, I do want to mention a few things, though, is... First off, uh, if you watched the video earlier of the baptism, I was, I was there, and it was really, really cool. Um, a little bit of a side story there. Randall, uh, one of my closest friends, is uh, sitting right there. Actually, he and I were baptized in that same part um, by Pastor Ron maybe like, like 10 years ago, it feels like. We were really young, but it's really awesome to be a part of that now, baptizing folks and being called to do those certain things. So it's really cool to be a part of that. I got really emotional during some parts because it's so cool to see folks changed for God. Another few things is that in the announcements, we did talk about a few things. One is that Youth Retreat is coming up. It's July 11 through 13. Uh, our speaker is Pastor Marty Okaya, who is the Elevate Director from CCF Maine. Um, if you like to go or maybe you know someone who wants to go, even if they are a maybe and don't even go, I have some forms. You can talk to me. I can give you a form you can fill out and we can have you in our system. Second, with that movie night, that movie night is a fundraiser for those who, youth members who want to go to youth retreat but can't fully afford youth retreat. Um, so 100% of those proceeds will go to that fund to making sure that anyone who wants to go to youth retreat, no matter how much it is, uh, will help out. Um, and yeah, so like Pastor Ron said, uh, we'll be going into uh, the book of Acts chapter 13. And I don't know. I, I, it still amazes me. It still amazes me how God uses people like me. Um, in, in that song that we sang, how it says, um, I'm still standing here because of God's grace. Uh, it really spoke to me this morning because um, even though I'm up here, it, it, it always feels like I'm unworthy. It always feels like I'm unqualified. It always feels like I shouldn't be up here. Um, but God uses people like me, uses people like you. Uh, for his kingdom all the time. Um, so like I said, we were in the book of Acts. It, it's, uh, the, the thing today is, as we've been going through the series in the book of Acts, truth matters, share the truth, change the world. Uh, but before we fully get into that, I do want to pray. So if you want to pray with me right now. Uh, Lord, Heavenly Father, God, uh, thank you, Lord, so much for this wonderful time, God, where we can spend with you, Lord where we can worship your name, where we can pray for each other, where we can welcome each other and love each other, God. Uh, thank you so much um, that this church continues to grow, that you continue in this church, God. I ask you, Lord, to be with us in this moment. God. Let us be a moment where we can learn more about you, God, where we can open our hearts to your word, Lord, where we can be used by you, God. I ask you, Lord, to be with me, Lord, uh, an imperfect person, someone who doesn't always deserve to be up here, Lord, but you continually use me, God. Let it be your words and not mine, God. Let it be known, Lord, that uh, without you, I am nothing, God. Um, and again, Lord, um, don't let it be about me, but let it be 100% about you, God. Thank you, God, for your love and your grace and for your son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for us, God. Uh, in your name, amen. So, uh, I want to start off by asking you all a question. How many of y'all have ever been distracted? Distracted. There's only like 10 people. That's great. Uh, whoever's been distracted, or maybe have you ever been, have, some, have you ever done something that caused something bad to happen because you were distracted? Um, one of my, I've shared this story before, but I really want to just kind of revel in that embarrassment. One of my biggest um, faux pas in, in sports, in my, shorts or, my short organized sports career, happened when I was a junior in high school. A junior in high school, um, and I decided, uh, or I was asked to play baseball. Uh, if you know anything about me, when I was a junior in high school, I never even, really even touched a baseball. I never even threw the ball with my dad. I had zero experience with the game of baseball. Uh, but my friend, um, who was also the team captain, whose dad was also the coach, asked me to play baseball because the year before, we didn't have a baseball team because there wasn't enough people. And so I was part of this baseball team, um, and it was really cool. It was really awesome, but I was very, very bad, right? I'm not even going to lie to you. I was not good at baseball. Um, and so I remember 
Um, even though we didn't have a team before, even though our, our, our varsity team was filled with juniors and freshmen, uh, we came out of the gate, out of starting our season really, really well. We were surprising people, we were making the local papers about how hard we were working and things of that nature. And I remember um, we were having this game against our arch rivals. I forgot the name of the school, uh, but we were playing against them and, and something happened. Just a little bit of a backtrack here. That week in practice, again, not very good in baseball. Uh, my coach has been in center field. I don't, I don't play center field. So he put me in center field. I was talking to my man Chase. And he was like, all right, uh, you're next. And he was talking to me. And so I was, I was in center field. And he takes the ball and he hits it towards me. If you know anything about baseball technique, the first thing you do is you kind of step back to making sure that if it goes over your head, you have a head start. And so I step back. But then I realize that the coach decides to just line it at me, just go straight towards me. And so I step back, but I look, that's coming really fast, so I start sprinting. If you know anything about me in high school, something I'm really proud of, my soccer coach said that I was the fastest guy in high school, right? So I started sprinting as fast as I could to make sure I can catch this ball. And I'm going, and I'm going, and I'm looking at the ball, it's like, yeah, I got this. I'm running, and it goes underneath my glove because I'm running so fast, and it hits me right in the chest. If that wasn't embarrassing enough, my, my, my friends, my coach, my teammates, they were all laughing at me and I was embarrassed. And if you know anything about me, I'm like, I'm like I don't like being embarrassed, right? Um, and so, um, well, like I said, we were playing our arch rivals that week. And for some reason that day, it was raining on and off. And if you know anything about baseball is that if it rains too much, you have to stop the game. So it rains too much, we stop the game, we wait. And then we go back in, and if it clears up, we play again, and it rains, we stop. So that's what kept happening that day. It kept raining, we stopped, it stopped raining, we played, it kept raining, and we stopped. It happened multiple times. And when it comes to baseball, if you're a pitcher and you have too much time resting, the coach takes you out. And so he was taking people out, and he was putting people in, and it got to the point where we were, like, tied or something, right? Against our arch rifles, we were tied. And I remember my coach saying, Bob... That was my nickname in high school. Short story, long story. I'm not going to share it with you. But he was like, Bob, get in right field. We need you there right now. If you know anything about right field, right field is where the people who don't know how to play, play baseball goes. So he was playing it safe, right? He said, we need you in right field to making sure that we have some fresh players out there. And it just stopped raining, so it was a little bit of a rain delay. And I remember I was in right field. I was standing there. I was thinking, it's not going to come to me. The ball never goes into right field. If you're right-handed, you have to angle the bat very specifically to making sure it goes to right field. So it's not obviously not going to go to right field. So I was there. I was chilling. I was looking cool. If you guys know anything, I had some pictures of me in high school. If you guys know who Ichiro is, I look like Ichiro in right field. I was just chilling there, right? Nothing's really happening. And then like maybe like half an inning goes by. We have a runner on, 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 on second or third. And then obviously where the story is going is the, the batter hits a pop fly to me, which means it's a little, really easy. If, if you just go right under, um, anybody can catch it. So again, my baseball technique says I go backwards. And I was like, oh, it's a really shallow, really close, short pop fly. So what I do is start sprinting towards it yet again. As fast as I can, I'm running, I'm running, I'm running. I have my glove out like this. But in my mind, in that three second span, I'm thinking, man, do you remember what happened in practice this week? If you run too fast, it's going to hit you in the chest. You're going to lose the game. You're going to look ridiculous, not only in front of your teammates and the coach, but in front of the whole school. There's girls over there. You never know what might happen. And so I'm running, I'm running. I was like, I need to slow down. So I started slowing down a little bit, and I'm looking at it. And then what happens is that it falls, it hits the front of my glove, and it falls to the ground. I panic. So I take the ball, and I, I just throw it as hard as I can towards the infield. I miss the pitcher. Um, three, like two runs score, and we end up losing the game. And the thing is, that, that was a big turning point in, my, in, in, in our season. We lost that game, and then we lost a bunch of games after that. We missed the playoffs, so what was, was supposed to be a good start kind of ended with me. I will tell you now, though, um, my wiffle ball team in church is undefeated, so, you know, <laughs> we're good now, right? So one of the biggest mistakes, right, uh, one of the biggest mistakes of my life happened because I was not fully paying attention. I wasn't fully focused and I was distracted. Let me show you something else. Let me show you a few statistics here. Bam, right? It says, uh, the automotive uh, industry says that using a cell phone while driving causes an estimated 1.5 million car accidents 
in the United States in 2018. Uh, it says the U.S. Department of Transportation reported that phone use while driving kills 3,000 to 6,000 people every single year. And that texting while driving is contributing a cause of 25% of all car accidents, resulting in 400,000 physical injuries. Texting while driving five times as many accidents than drunk driving. My mom isn't here, which is, fan, which, is, which, which, is, which is sad, but also really great because I, 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 I text and drive a whole lot. Like I text, I text and drive so much. I remember that we were, I think I was driving a handle and we have a group chat going and he literally told everybody to block me on the group chat so I would stop texting and driving. Uh, I remember one time I was driving to work. I live in San Francisco, but I work in Belmont. And I was driving on 280, going towards San Mateo. And I remember somebody asking me what somebody's birthday was or something like that. And so I was driving. And usually when I'm driving and decide to text, I go into the slow lane. But this time I was like, you know, I'm good. So I have my phone. It's down here so the cop won't see me. And I'm going like 80 miles an hour in the fast. And I, I'm, I'm going like this, right? I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm good, I'm good. And then I, I find him on Facebook, and I look, oh, that's his birthday. And then when I look up, there is this massive truck that is like, you know, the ones that, like, clean the side of the road? That's, like, going, like, 10 miles an hour. And I'm going at 80 miles an hour. So I'm like, there's, like, maybe 10 car lengths. I look over my shoulder really, really quickly, and I went, boom! And I dodge it, right? And you can see that everybody around me Right, everyone around me has slowed down so much because they saw how fast I was going and I was about to hit the thing. Right, so my story, right, my stories show that mental distractions can lead to bad losses in one way or another. Uh, those statistics show that, that, that physical distractions uh, have real life consequences. We live in a physical world, so if we are distracted, it can lead to fatality. But let me tell you folks, today, though we do live in a physical world, right? Though we do live in a physical world, do not forget that we live in a spiritual world as well. Uh, Paul says in the book of Ephesians, For our struggles is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. And then it goes on to there in, in, uh, in, in those verses to talk about the armor of God. And then he goes on forward saying, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the spirit. And with this in view, be on alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. So what was our message again last week? Do you all remember what Pastor Ron talked about? Pray without ceasing. Was that Cherry? She, oh, I pray without ceasing, right? Today, as we embark into, into Acts 13, the main, thing, the main thing that we want to talk about today is, is listen to God's voice by fasting and obeying. Listen to God's voice. So how do we do that? How, do we, how are we able to listen to God's voice in a world that is so distracting? By fasting, which includes prayer, and by obeying. We live in a distracting world, right? We live in a world that is distracting, that unless, uh, unless we can hear God's voice, unless we know his will, how can we navigate through this world without falling, hurting ourselves or, others, or even our walk with God? Remember that the spiritual consequences are larger than the physical ones. So as we go into Acts 13, what we really want to point out, right, we really want to point out the first part of Acts that we've been covering so far covers the early church of Jerusalem and it covers the life of Peter covering the Jewish church and now but now acts it shifts right it shifts into the the Gentile church and Paul and what they and and, and we have to realize that the Gentile church is the church that consists of non-Jews who became followers of Christ in fact we are the Gentile church so the early Gentile church gives us a great example of what the church should look Today, let's keep going here. It says in Acts 13, 1, now they were at Antioch in the church that was there, the prophets and the teachers. So right there, right, the early church had these prophets and teachers, and it goes and gives you a little bit of a list here. First, we have Barnabas, 
We learned about Barnabas, right? He was a Jew. He was a super encouraging guy. Pastor Ron talked him about him already. So he was there. Uh, next, we have Simeon, who was also called Niger. Niger, it, just by the state of the word, um, is, is, is attuning to that he was African, right? In the context, in the times where, uh, in those ancient times where there were so many racial barriers, that is so important. Next, we have Lucius, who is from Cyrene. Cyrene is also in, in that African continent, but a little bit more Arabic in that descent. And then we have Manning, who was raised with Herod the Tetrarch. That we can know is that he was a super wealthy guy. He grew up in royalty. And lastly, we have Saul. Saul, who is Paul. Saul, who was also a, not only a very highly educated Jew, but, and something I like to point out every single time I mention Paul, he was a former persecutor of Christians. See, now why is that important when it comes to talking about how church works? Each of the leaders of this church, right? These are the leaders of, that, of the early church. Each of those leaders had different backgrounds, had different races, had, had different pasts. In an ancient time where, where there are legitimate social and racial barriers, where the early church, where people will hold things against you all the time, the early church showed that there was no room for that sort of distraction, early church looked past those things. The early church, the Gentile church, was a mixture, uh, an amalgamation of godly men. But how do we know they were godly men? How do we know that they were spirit-filled? Let's keep going here. So while they were ministering to the Lord, according to this passage right there, while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, according to that passage right there, first ministry, right? Our first ministry, according to that passage, is to Lord. Do we all know what, what ministering to the Lord means? Ministering to the Lord means to worship God. And how do you worship God? You worship God by spending time with Him. If you look at the context that these guys mentioned earlier, the Barnabas and, and Saul and those guys, uh, they were church leaders. They were church leaders of the early church. Uh, they, they, it was a church that was breaking barriers and making waves. As a church leader myself and as other church leaders in here say, uh, there's a lot of responsibility that comes with church leadership. There's a lot of responsibility that comes with, I'm going to switch my Jeez, sorry, sorry. Hello? Hello, hello? We're good. Yeah, we're good, right? So uh, there's a lot of responsibility that comes with church leadership. There's a lot of responsibility when it comes to ministry. But the passage itself does not start focusing on the accomplishments of these people. It does not show the work that they are doing. It focuses, and the first thing that they, that they talk about is ministering or worshiping the Lord and fasting. Folks, to, to fully worship the Lord. To fully worship God means you have to make time for him. You have to set time aside in your schedule for him. And we're not talking about, you know, being within the church community. We're not talking about just being in D groups. Those are all really, really important. But we're talking about daily time with the Lord. See, the early church, the early church is a great example of what we should strive to follow. They were godly men. They were spirit-filled. They were aligned and in tune with God's calling for them. But now, folks, as we, as we saw this great example, as we, as we looked into how the early church was supposed to be structured, and as we look into our own lives, why is it so hard to be in tune with God? Uh, John Piper said it best when he said, the greatest enemy of hunger for God is not poison, but apple pie. It's not the banquet of the wicked that dulls our appetite for heaven, but endless nibbling at the table of the world. It's not the X-rated video, but the prime time dribble of triviality we drink in every night. The things that take us away from God aren't necessarily always the worst things. They could be the good things in life. They could be blessings in life that take us away from God. They could be the small things in life. We live in a distracted world. Be being here and surrounding ourselves with these things make it difficult to hear God. He's speaking, right? He's speaking, but it's sometimes hard to hear him. 
So let me ask you again, folks, what are some of your distractions? As you reflect, what are some of your distractions? I asked uh, the, this question on Friday to the Elevate group. Uh, young people said the first thing they said was cell phones. Big distraction. Technology. A young lady said that some of her own personal goals were distracting her away from God. One of my young guys said girls. I was like, yeah, it can be, right? Not for me, though. Don't worry about that, right? Uh, so, we, so we have things like, like Netflix and HBO and Twitter and social media accounts, all sorts of things. For me, for me personally, I'm a big TV show and movie guy. I like watching movies. But if I'm watching those shows and movies every single night, it takes away ample time away from him. Whatever it may be, right? Whatever it may be, we all get distracted. And that is why the message today is, again, listen to God's voice by fasting and obeying. We have to take time out of our day. We have to spend time with him. We have to fast certain things and be with him. Some folks, um, the, 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 ultimate, the, the first thing people think about when it's fasting is, is food. But it could be other things in your life that you're putting your time into. We have to fast and be with him. The folks, the best way to plan anything, the best way to plan your week is to plan those things before it even happens. Right? When it comes to your week, you may lay out what's important in your life. You may be a businessman or a businesswoman. You may be a, a father or a mother. You may be a student or a leader. So for when you plan those things for work, you can say, for work, I have to do this and this and this. I'm going to put that there. Right. As a parent, you may say, uh, my kid has this and this, this to do. Uh, they'll need me for this. So I'll put that in my schedule. And as a student, for me, I have this to do. I have this to do. I have this to do. I will work on them on this day and this day and this day. And, and that's the best way usually to plan those things. That is your very typical, very normal lifestyle and schedule. Those are the normal everyday roles that people have. But see, folks, the one role. The one role that people tend to forget that they have. The one role that they kind of pass over as not as important as those things that I just mentioned is the one uh, where we are called to be children of God. The one thing that we cannot skip out on is that role. We need to spend time with him. We need to put that into our schedule before anything else. It's so hard to, put, to, to, to do those things when everything else is already scheduled. Put God first. And I'm saying this as, as, as a Christian that this isn't a suggestion, right? This, I'm not suggesting that you do this. I'm not telling you this is kind of what you should be doing. I'm telling you this is a need for a Christian walk to be successful, for you to have a relationship with God. It's an everyday thing because God is speaking, Right? God is speaking. God, God makes his will clear, but we cannot hear him if we are continually forgetting and neglecting that part of our life. So the next part of the verse uh, says that, um, so they were ministering to the Lord and then the Holy Spirit said, right? The Holy Spirit said, is the Holy Spirit of the early church the same that we have today? Right? Does he still speak? Right. And so he does. I remember back when I was debating um, whether I should go to seminary or not. This was uh, two, almost two years ago. And I was thinking I was praying. And, you know, what I did is that um, I, I, I went to God every single day about it for probably a year and a half, two years, really trying to debate. God, is this what you're really calling me to do? God, do you really want me to do all these things instead of what I've already been doing? And I, I went to, to school for this degree already. Lord, are you sure you're calling me to go there? Right. In my experience. In my experience, the best way to go before God is with an open hand. Because God guides. We cannot go before God and force him into the things that we want. Telling him what we want to do. In, in any moment, right? In any moment, we can share with God what's on our heart. But when you fast and you pray, it's you going before God so that you can do what God is calling you to do. God desires for you to know his will. God desires for you to do his will. If you go before him and desire to do his will, he will answer. Because y'all realize that God is perfect, right? His, his, his way may not always be what your way is, um, but when you follow his ways, his ways are the best ways, right? 
His plans are perfect. His plans will, will lead you into the best po pathway possible. Does God speak today? Yes, absolutely he does. But the question for you folks, the question for you folks is, do you hear his voice? This reminds me of a, of a, of a story um, in 1 Kings with Elijah. I don't know if you guys know who I'm talking about, but Elijah was running for his life, right? And God tells, tells him to go to a very specific spot. And when he gets there, he couldn't hear or feel God's presence. And all of a sudden, these great and crazy and, and big things started happening. Um, it says that there was this crazy wind that went through that was so strong it was breaking rocks. But God wasn't in it. And after that big crazy wind, uh, there was an earthquake, but God wasn't in it. After that, after this giant earthquake, there was a fire, and yet God was still not there. And then after all these crazy things happened, after all these natural disasters happened, it's, it's not like totally out of mind to think that God would be in there, but he wasn't. After all that, right, it said that there was a gentle blowing. And in that gentle bit of wind, there was God. I share that because too often when we're trying to listen to God, trying to listen and obey, trying to fast and do all these things, we expect this great and audible sound. We expect fireworks or very obvious movement. Sometimes we, we, we open up our Bible and do one of these and hopefully God will talk to us. Can God speak in those ways? Absolutely, right? He can. But from my experience, it is in those quiet moments with God, one-on-one, -on -one, focused on his word, focused in prayer, in the stillness of his presence, that's when his will becomes clearer and clearer. God does speak today, obviously. But when he does make his will out to you, after you have that time with God, do you obey? We'll stay here for a while. So going in here further, it says, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work I have called them. Right? The second part of the passage, it says that. Was it clear, right? Was it totally clear what God was saying or what the Holy Spirit was saying? A little bit of a yes and no. It says, yes, we're supposed to set apart Paul and Barnabas. But was the goal clear? Was the purpose clear? This isn't that passage here. Was the purpose clear? What work were they were supposed to do? Sometimes, right? Sometimes God says go. If you look at the story of Abraham, right? If you look at the story of Abraham, God says, go to the land that I will show you. We have to go sometimes. There have been many times where, where I'm sure, I'm absolutely sure where you want to know the, what the end result is. Where you want to know what God has in store for you. Where you want to know what you've been praying for. That you're tired of waiting. That you're tired of doing all these things and just want the results. Anybody see here, anyone here see the, uh, the Avengers movies? Right? The uh, Affinity Wars and, 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 and Endgame, right? Um, in Infinity Wars, Doctor Strange says that there's only one outcome that will lead to their victory, right? And, and, and like, like Doctor Strange, as Christians, we know the outcome of this all. We already know the Endgame. We know that in the Endgame, Jesus is victorious. There is no doubt in that, right? But between now and that end game, between now and Jesus, Jesus reigning victoriously, we have this Christian walk, which if you really look at it for those, especially in the older generations, will tell you it's an adventure. Right? You may not know what the next step is. But when, you, when God calls you and you have that step and you step forward and obey, it will always, I'm going to say this again, it will always be worth it. As the Holy Spirit set apart Paul and Barnabas, he also set apart, he also set us apart to do his will. I hope you all realize, or I hope you all realize that God has called all of us. It's not just me, it's not just Pastor Ron, it's not just Tita Renee, he has called all of us. But how could you know? His calling, or how can we know his calling for you if you're not taking the time to listen to his voice? So that is what they did, right? That is what they did as an early church, and God spoke clearly. They fasted and they obeyed. You know, in the Old Testament, for them to properly worship God, they would have to bring a sacrifice. Today, though, today, though, we, we live in the assurance that Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice. Because of what he did on the cross, dying for our sins, we no longer have to bring that sacrifice in that nature of the Old Testament. 
He was and is the ultimate sacrifice, right? But does that mean that following God, does that mean that there's no sacrifice involved? Let's read here in, in Romans 12.1. It says, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is spiritual service of worship. When we come to know him, there is still a sacrifice to be made, right? It's no longer for our sins. Jesus already took care of that. And we can live in that. We can be assured of that. But it is in our own body, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to him. It could be our time. It could be our talents. It could be in church. It could be in the workplace. But God is calling all of us for his will. And it's causing, calling all of us to f sacrifice our bodies for him. Because there are so many needs around us. Even in this church, there are so many needs around us. But the problem is that we are too distracted. We're too distracted and we don't hear God's voice or see his will. So let's keep reading here. Is that, then when they had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them and they were sent away. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Cilicia and from there they sailed to Cyprus. So who sent them again? The church or the Holy Spirit? The answer is both. Right? You see the church, right? The early church um, was filled with the Holy Spirit. They, Saul and Barnabas, were, were fasted and prayed for and prayed over. This is a really cool sight because it shows that the church was involved in what God was calling these people to do, what God is calling Barnabas and Paul to do. Sometimes folks can be very individualistic with their call from God. They will say that God has called me to the certain calling and, and, and no one's going to stop me from doing it. But how can you know for sure what God is calling you to do? Because even for me, um, as, as, as a youth leader for five years or so, as, as, as someone who's going to seminary and studies the word, even I sometimes have a different version of God in my head. Thinking that what I want, what I pray for is what God is calling for me. Making my will seem like his. For example, I've been um, praying for this one very specific prayer. Um, for probably over a year now. I was praying and I was praying. I was like, God, if this is for me, I'll let it happen. But if it's not for you, take the desire away from my heart. Right? And then I kept praying every single day. I was like, Lord, the desire is not leaving. It must be your will, right? Lord, the desire is still there a whole year. I mean, I must keep waiting out. I must keep pursuing because you're not taking this desire out of my heart. But after talking to a few people, Really talking about it, it became more and more clear that what, God, what I wanted was, not, was probably not what he wants for me. We try to morph things out by praying for certain things, thinking that if it's still there, that means God wants it for me. But it doesn't work that way. And so that is why we have the body of Christ. That is why we have each other. That is why we come together and share with one another. And that's why I encourage you that if you're not in a D group already, to join one. Because those right there are your brothers and sisters in Christ. Who, those who can, who can pray with you. Those who can hear your desires and can pray with you and can help validate those things that God is calling for you. See, God wants you to know his will more than you do. Makes it clear for you uh, and the more you spend time with him. But what is our role in all that? When, 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 the, when God's will is, is making more and more sense, our role is to obey. So in this case, we see Paul and Barnabas, right? They were called to go to the mission field. Um, if, you, if you know Paul and Barnabas, and I think uh, Pastor Ron talked about them last week or two weeks ago, they were really, really important people in the church, right? Um, you, if, if anything, you can see them as number one and number two of, of the leadership core, right? And, and, but, but, but God was still calling them to go into the mission field. And some folks may say, you know, why would you call, Lord, the two most important, supposedly two most important people in this church to go away from the church, from away from this church that we have already, what's it called, that we already established. But we have to realize, folks, that God does not make any mistakes, right? God, God, God calls who he calls that so that when they go to where they are called, they are most effective. When he calls you to stay, you stay. But when he calls you to go, you go. You have to be spirit-filled, be used by God where you are. See, the early church, right? The early church shows us that there are no superstars in any church. If God calls you somewhere, you obey God no matter who you are. If God asks for number one and number two, number one and number two should be, should be going and we should be happy to send them. So again, 
Paul and Barnabas got, gets, got, gets called by God. And if you show this, uh, this next picture here, it is a map of the kind of like the little adventure here, right? From starting from there at the yellow dot, they kind of go down to Salamis and Cyprus and go all the way around. But this next part of the story, we're going to pick it up. It's in Salamis, right? I'm going to pick it up in Salamis. So the package, the package, the passage, I said package like three times. The passage picks up there. So when they reach Salamis, it says, they began to proclaim the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they also had John as their helper. So what were, what were they doing? What were they doing as they were going about this journey for God? They were proclaiming the word of God. Like I said, God has called all of us. Right? God has called all of us. He has a mission for each one of us. Not only does he have that specific mission for you, that specific mission for me, but he also wants us to, to spread this message that he has in us. Proclaiming the word of God. But let's keep reading here, though. Let's keep reading. It says in, in verse 6, when they had gone through the whole island as far as Pap, Papos, they found a magician, a Jewish false prophet whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence. This man summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. So reading through that, we are introduced to two new people. The first is Bar-Jesus, and the second is Sergius Paulus. Bar-Jesus, um, when translated, means son of salvation. But right here, you already know that he's a, false, a Jewish false prophet. A proconsul at that time was a governor of a certain providence in the Roman Empire. He was a political leader. And this shows, right, this shows the importance of Paul and Barnabas' journey. You see, Paulus, right, Paulus was not only a proconsul, but he was a man of intelligence, right? You see, he, done, he did not know God, but he was interested in knowing God. So what did he do? He summoned Paul and Barnabas to him. So in that moment, right, in that moment, Barnabas and Saul shared with him the gospel of Jesus Christ. But look what happens next, right? Look what happens next. It says that in verse 8, But Elymas, the magician who was bar Jesus, for his name is translated, was opposing them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Away from the faith. You see what happened? This magician, this, this magician, this false prophet, tried to stop the message of Saul and Barnabas, to distract the proconsul away from, and, and sway him away from the faith. This shows, folks, right, this shows that, that even if, when you obey God, even when you answer his call on your life, even when you share the message to those who need to hear it, we can expect for sure 100%, the one thing that we can expect is opposition, every single time. Uh, Pastor Ron spoke yesterday at the baptism, and he mentioned that once you claim and follow Jesus Christ, you get a PhD, right? I, I, I'll be honest with you, I forgot what the D was, but it is persecuted, hated, and I said deserted, right? You get the PhD. There will always be opposition when it comes to the calling of Jesus. But let's keep reading here again. It says in, in verse 9, But Saul, who was also known as Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, it fixed his gaze on him and said, you who, you who are full of all deceit and fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease to make crooked the straight ways of the Lord? First of all, man, those are some harsh words, right? Son of the devil, whew, right? But in reality, right, that is the opposition that we will face. What is this theory called? Again? It's called truth matters. The opposition will try to make you, make the truth crooked, make, the, make crooked the truth of God. It's actually pretty, like, fascinating to see the wording that was used there to make crooked, right? To make crooked. The, the, the opposition that we will face, the opposition that Paul and Barnabas faced, um, they were the ones trying to, to kind of mess around with the truth. It doesn't say that they were sharing something totally different. It doesn't say that they were, like, that, like there was a whole different thing, but it was crooked. And this shows, this shows why it's so important, folks, why it's so important to spend time with him in prayer and his word. Because once you know the word, you know the truth. And once you know the truth, you can see the crookedness that people will throw into that. All the devil has to do, folks, right? All the devil has to do is, do is throw a little bit of crookedness into the truth. And it will derail your whole walk and it will der derail your whole belief. If, if you look at the temptation of Jesus, right? The devil was trying to use certain things out of, God, out of context to, to tempt Jesus, but what did Jesus do? 
he used the word of God back against him, the truth. He knew the word and he used it. I just kind of wanted to throw that in there. But let's keep reading in here, right? It says in, in verse 11, Now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and not see the Son of time, Son for a time. And immediately a mist and a darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking those who would lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what happened, being amazed at the teaching of the Lord. Right here we see a combination of, of God's words and miracle, and, and a miracle. Not only did God work his ways, but the proconsul believed in the word of God. Right? You, you see, we, we will face opposition as we follow God in our life. Right? We will face opposition. Um, actually, uh, 1 Peter says it best. Can we go to the next slide? It says, 1 Peter says, be sober in spirit. Be on alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a lion, like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. But resist him. Firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. Y'all, the devil's like a lion, right? The devil is like a lion. Have you ever seen a lion in person before? Like at a zoo or something? They're crazy. They're, 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 their animals are huge and dangerous. Um, Kay is here. Kay and Justin just came back from Africa. I stole this off of her Instagram account. So shout out to Kay. Follow her on, on Instagram. That is a lion, Right? That is a lion. If we were in that desert with Kay and Justin, all of a sudden this lion started chasing us, we are literally no match for it. They are faster, they are stronger, and they are more ferocious. And that is how the, the, the Bible describes the devil. But what does verse 9 say again? It says, resist him. Firm in, spirit, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experience of suffering are being accomplished by our brethren around the world. So how will Satan get to you? How will the devil get to you? It is in that moment of suffering. Do Christians suffer? Yes. As long as we live on this earth, there will be suffering. In that moment, though, when things aren't going your way, when you are tired and worn out, when you feel like giving up, that's when the devil will pounce. He will discourage you. He will bring about lies. Does God really love you? Are you sure he really wants what's best for you? Are his plans really better than yours? Look at your life. Why would, why would he let you go through that? Why would he let that happen to your family? If he really loved you, then why would he fail you and, and have you fail and lose everything? He doesn't really love you. But what does Peter say again? It says, stand firm in the faith. I'm going to show you one more picture. The next one. Hold on one second. Right? This is also from Kay and Justin, right? Thank you, guys. You guys take some awesome pictures. Um, so this is, so the devil is like a lion, right? And he prowls and he waits for you to be discouraged. And you know how ferocious lions are? Let's show this next picture. That is a lion with a boar's head in its mouth. That is the ferocity of a lion. If you are in those moments of discomfort, if you're in that moment of discouragement, if you're in those moments where you feel like giving up and you don't spend time with God and you say, no, God, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna skip my quiet time, I'm tired, I'm a, I'm, a little, I'm a little worn out, that is what'll happen to you. If you, if you say, you know, I, I go to church and I go to Bible study, that's enough, and when those things come, when discouragement comes, when things start going wrong, that is what'll happen to you. The devil will take you and he will attack and he will pounce on you. Do you know why it's important to stand firm in the faith? Do you know why it's important to spend time with God? Because in those moments, when things aren't going well, when you are suffering and life is too much, we can lean on the fact that the Word of God says that He will never leave you nor forsake you. You, you will know that you are never alone. We can hold on to the fact, and, and as we read the Word of God, especially in the Gospels, we know that Jesus also suffered. He suffered more than anyone has ever suffered, he, but he is with us. He has suffered with us. He stands by our side. We have him in our corner. It says in the book of James, Submit therefore to God. <clears throat> Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Resist the devil and he will free from you. flee from you. Personally speaking, when I'm frustrated, when I'm stressed out, when things aren't going my way, when I'm, when, I'm fear, when I'm feeling tired and I feel like God isn't listening to me, I have this tendency to fall into temptation. 
More often than not, it means cutting corners on things that are, are, are important or, or just not spending time with them. But as of recently, folks, as of recently, and I don't know, maybe, maybe this only works for me, but as of recently, I'm doing something different. Uh, when things come up and I'm tempted to do something other than be in his presence, when, when something pops in my head and it says, dude, you had a long day. Dude, you suck at doing what you're doing. Your life is like this, so why don't you just skip your quiet time with God today? Just watch another episode, watch another movie, play a few more games. And, 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 and I'll be honest with you, um, I've fallen into that pit so many times. But as of recently, like I was saying, when that urge would come up, that first moment I, I sense it, and again, this works for me, I don't know if it will work for you, but it says, I say very audibly, I say, not today, Satan. Right? Not today. And for some reason, the urge to skip, the urge to fall into sin, eases off of me. Submit and rest and he will flee from you. The second verse says in 1 John, it says, uh, you are from God, little children, and have overcome them. You are from God, little children, and you have overcome them because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Who is in the world? Satan. Satan. He's ruling the world. But if you are in Christ, who is with you? Jesus. And it tells us very plainly that he who is in us, which is Jesus, is greater than he who is in the world, which is Satan. If we continue in this book of Acts, I think that's the last, that's the last one right there. If we continue this book of Acts, we see this continued journey of Paul. You see his first sermon. You see where he starts beginning this, this kind of cool Jewish history and teaching on this Jewish history and then seamlessly uh, introducing Jesus Christ into all of that. The journey of Paul, right? The journey of Paul and sharing this gospel to the Gentiles um, and what he did. He was called by God. People fasted and prayed for him. And because of what he did, leaving the, the, the comfort and, and the success of this Antioch church, that word has now reached us. It happened due to the obedience of the church of Antioch. It happened because Paul and Barnabas decided, or decided to follow God and obey his word and preach to the non-Jews. Because they were obeying God. And it was revealed that if you focus on him through fasting and prayer, his, his calling becomes more clear. And when you follow your calling for God, great things will happen. And, and, and folks, right? Um, I, I, was, I, was, I was talking to the kids on Friday about distractions. The, the one thing that folks forget to mention when it comes to distractions is that is that one of the biggest distractions in life that people will not tell you are the blessings in your life. And I'm, let, me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me kind of expound that a little bit. When you're, when you're praying to God for a certain thing, right? when you're praying to God for a certain thing, and maybe it might be a job, maybe it might be getting to a school, maybe it might be um, um, I'm getting to a relationship, and you're praying to God, Lord, I, please God, I want this, I, need, I, don't, I don't know if I need this, but I want it, Lord, I want it, Lord, I want it, Lord. And, and he gives it to you. Or he gives you an opportunity to give that, that thing for you. Um, and, and, but you use that blessing of God. You use that blessing of God and you fall away from him. I was telling the kids that God did not give you that blessing so that you will forget him. God did not give you that, that job. God did not give you that relationship so that you can cut off God in your life. And that's what we have to look out for. That's what we're fighting against. But folks, like... For everyone here, you have this opportunity to be with God every single day. You, you, you have 24 hours in your day. You have moments every day to spend time with Him, to read your word, to pray. You have every week, every day to fast. I know there's this thing going around, the intermittent fasting. People do that all the time. And you can use that time to focus on God. Everyone who believes in God has an opportunity to be in a relationship with him, has an opportunity to hear his word, has an opportunity to hear his will. If you want to hear the will of God, that means spending time with him outside of this. Jesus Christ died on the cross. While we were still sinners, while we were separated from God, he died on the cross so that we can have that relationship with him. I was uh, reading a devotional, 
and um, about and, and I screenshot of this 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 thing, and it says Jesus essentially says to us, "I call you only to do the things that you were created to do, and you will find therefore that my yoke is easy. I put on you the burden of following, but I have already paid the price, so that." When you fail, you'll be forgiven. I've taken off of you the burdens that other people have. I've removed the burden of earning your own salvation through striving and effort. I've removed the, the burden of guilt or shame for past failures. I've taken off the burden of having to prove yourself worthy of love. I am therefore the only Lord and Master who, if you find me, will satisfy you. But if you fail me, will forgive you. Jesus Christ did all that for us. And if you don't have that relationship just yet, if you want to hear the call of God but you don't have that closeness, we have the opportunity every day, every moment, every single Sunday to give our life to Him. I am therefore the only Lord and Master who, if you find me, I will satisfy you. And if you fail me, I will forgive you. Shall we pray? Our Lord, Heavenly Father, God, we come to you, Lord, in this moment needing you, God. We, we live in such a distracting world, Lord. There are so many things around us that want us to take us away from you, Lord. There's so many things around us that, that want to distract us, God. There's so many things around us that want to pull us away from you, Lord. And I ask you, God, for, for, for you to be with us in this moment, Lord. To be with us in this moment, God, so that we can give it all to you, Lord. We know, Lord, that the, that the physical ramifications of this world are, are so much smaller than the spiritual, spiritual implications, God. We know, Lord, that following you or not following you is an eternal decision. So I ask you, God, Lord, that if there's anyone in this room, God, who has been distracted their whole life, who's been, been pulled away from you, God, there's anyone in this church, Lord, who, who wants to hear your voice, who wants to know your will, who wants to be reassured by you, God, that they take this moment, God, to realize that they can only get that through you. Be with anyone here, Lord, who has a heart, God, to know you more who wants that relationship with you, God. Let them know, Lord, that you died on the cross, God. That you died on the cross for their sins, Lord. That you died on the cross and rose again on the third day for us so that we can have that relationship with God. Sin separate us from you, Lord, but Jesus Christ made the way. And we know, Lord, that Jesus is the way the only way, the truth, and the life. I ask you, Lord, to be with anyone here who already has that relationship with God but has been distracted by the things of this world. I ask you, Lord, to help them realize what's going on in their life. Realize how important this, this relationship is with you, God. Realize that you are the life giver, Lord. That when they are tired and when they are worn out, they can go to you, God. Help those are in this room, Lord, who are distracted, God, to give everything to you, Lord. Because you plus everything, plus nothing is everything. We don't need anything else in this world, God. All we need is you, and with you, we have everything. Be with the church, God. Let them know, Lord, that, that we are called by you, God. That it's not just the leaders of the church who have been called, but you have called all of us. Call to share your word, Lord. Call to proclaim your name, God. Let us not be held within this church, God. Let us not be held within um, under the confines of, of Millbrae or Burlingame, Lord, but really just going out and sharing your word, Lord. Give us the confidence, God, that you are with us till the end of the age. In your name, amen.